numbers. Why would you have an accounting professor come here and talk about demystifying numbers? Well, because I guess a lot of the mystery is created by my profession or my colleagues or those of us who really, uh, really care about numbers and we find them quite straightforward. But the point is really to, um, to <coughs> demystify them. Really, it's about making them easier to understand. Okay? And the way I feel about uh, the need to demystify anything is really it's got to be either obscure, it's got to be unknown, there is something difficult to understand it, but oftentimes the point about needing to demystify something is also explaining why one should bother to know something. And so I think oftentimes with my subject, accounting and uh, the outcome of the process that we sort of uh, put information through and generate financial statements, I think what is generally lost is the connection between the underlying economic events and how they are translated into numbers. So when I say demystify numbers, the session, the way I interpreted my job for this afternoon is to really make a case for numbers. Why should you worry about numbers or care to know more about them? Okay. And then, of course, um, numbers, and I don't uh, want to sort of be... Um, saying negative things about numbers, because I don't think all numbers require demystifying. So there are some famous numbers we are all familiar with. I suppose you have heard of the number pi before. You know what it is. If you divide the circumference of a circle by its diameter, you're going to get this constant, which has many, 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 many non-repeating digits. And if you use a lot of computational power, you can get more digits added to it. But we don't need to demystify that number. We know that. Um, some other famous numbers, we know all number 10 Downing Street, again, requires no demystification. Um, well, famous, infamous, I don't know how you feel about it these days, that's for you to <laughs> judge. Um, but it's a famous number, I don't really need to tell you what happens behind those doors, we see that on a regular basis. Another famous number, this is, I must plug this in, this is a request from my son who is 12. This is his most famous number, number 12, those of you who are celebrating American Thanksgiving today. Happy Thanksgiving. He's a, he's a, a quarterback uh, <laughs> with the Patriots. He's, he's pretty good, apparently. I'm told. I've seen a few games. He's, he's not bad. Anyway, <laughs> number 12. And then, and then, of course, if we sort of bring it back closer to home, some famous people in numbers. I kept the title, some famous numbers. So this was in the FT a few days ago, a couple of weeks ago, to be specific, November 9th. Uh, she and uh, her husband uh, took a tour in Australia, which is my second home, and um, they uh, obviously took with them many things, including her wardrobe, and the FT, being the financial press, uh, summarized the event in numbers, okay? Again, doesn't require much demystification. It's about the cost of her wardrobe and variety of numbers of things she's used and things she's done, again, requiring no demystification. So why do I really need a session of an hour, which I will spare some of it for Q&A at the end? Why do we really need this whole thing about demystifying numbers? Uh, many times uh, in my role as, uh, as the academic director of one of the courses here, actually, finance or non-finance executives, and some students that I teach in the degree program sitting in the same seats that you do today, I get this sentiment either in their expressions or in their literal verbal uh, declarations of how they feel about the subject. I am not a numbers person. Now, I don't think there are types of people, to be honest. You might like numbers, you might dislike numbers, but I think the reason I hear this from anybody is because I didn't bother immersing myself into the types of numbers you talk about. This would be me, the financial statements. I haven't got sufficient familiarity and I feel uncomfortable looking at them because I think I'm behind some of the group that I'm with. Okay, so that's one reason. Or when I see executives uh, with this attitude or uh, declaration of how they feel about the numbers, it is generally the senior executives who are taking part in variety of decision making, actually being in charge of numbers, but not necessarily feeling confident about their mastery of the numbers. So my job at the school, many times that I appear in front of um, my students, the audience, is about breaking the ice with the numbers. Okay, so 
what I will try to do is give you a reason as to why you shouldn't really say, I'm not a numbers person, or I really couldn't be bothered looking at numbers, but sort of at least one reason why you might want to, what you might want to do. So here is the type of numbers I'm talking about. And I intentionally put it small, because this is the impression we give to the outside world when we give them a financial statement that looks exactly like this in an annual report. Okay? <coughs> this is one of the main financial statements. It's called a balance sheet. I'm sure you've heard of it s before. Talks about different resources a business has, and then how the business gets access to those resources using different types of funding. So that's, that's what it is. So besides it being fine print at this point, even if you were to sort of zoom into it, and I just took the assets section of the balance sheet, where you get to see this business, and I'm going to reveal in a second who that is. Regardless of how big, how magnified, how neatly it is presented, and it is, we do care about the format, by the way. You're going to see things underlined and sort of indented, etc., to group them to, uh, together clearly, we think they are still not sufficiently clear unless you have a reason to look at them. Okay? It's a collection of numbers. They come from underlying events and transactions. So that's, that's a bigger font using the same information, and it's the total resources this particular business has. And perhaps to um, so some of you is a sup uh, surprise, maybe it looks no different than this picture, right? It's a <laughs> list. It has some squiggles on it, especially when you look at it in the small font. This essentially is the same as what I just showed you. This is a Sumerian balance sheet. Okay? I wasn't really joking when I said they look similar. They are similar. This is a farmer who is listing its uh, cattle, etc., and uh, sort of how it changed over the period. So they are the same, but at face value, when we don't speak the language, they might as well literally be the same. Right? So how do we sort of go about thinking uh, in terms of why should we really approach the numbers and approach them with purpose, OK? Right. So the previous numbers, the actual numbers, not the sort of uh, Sumerian tablet uh, carvings that I showed you, but the actual numbers came from Aston Martin, uh, their most recent financials. And the reason I picked them is something that we like doing at this school is uh, using uh, really current information. So I picked Aston Martin because very recently they listed themselves on the main market at the LSE, London Sco Stock Exchange. And they have, uh, as a part of that process, they had to uh, obviously go through a lot of filings and produce a lot of financial statements. So if you are like me from outside, right, the public member of the public, if you really wanted to know a bit more about Aston Martin's financial conditions, one opportunity you will have is when they file these documents, and you can sort of dig deeper into them. So those numbers came from Aston Martin, and um, they list basically the kinds of assets, the resources that Aston Martin has as at the time of their reporting. And um, if you, and if, if I sort of quickly go back, and I'm not going to do back and forth too many times, but if you look at their assets without worrying about the label definitions, because this is not going to be a crash course on translating every accounting label on a balance sheet. But if you look at them, they have a lot of long-term assets, non-current assets, assets they are expected to last them for a long period of time. Large chunk of which okay, is what is called intangible assets. So these would be their brands, et cetera, that are aggregated. So this company you would expect to have good uh, brand recognition if their numbers translate into the financial statements reported. That is, if they have, of course, acquired them through transactions. All right? And of course, they have some current assets. One current asset we will, want to ex we will expect to see in pretty much every balance sheet is going to be cash and cash equivalents. And then, of course, if you really want to think about the balance sheet and its strength, you might say, OK, do they have enough cash to cover their near-term obligations information, which I haven't uh, sort of blown up to show you. But it was in the fine print slides if you want to look them up again. All right, so that's just sort of a few things from Aston Martin and a bunch of uh, information uh, listed in a tabular format. And I still haven't yet told you why would you want to look at any of this. Now, let me try to make a case for numbers, OK? I would like people to think about numbers, my type of numbers. And I gave you some examples from outside of my expertise, right? The, the introductory warm-up with numbers aside. 
I would like people to think about numbers, financial information, in other words, that's what I mean when I say numbers, as a language, a language for the business. Okay? And like any other language, it has some tools. Okay? Tools like alphabets, tools like um, words, and of course, as you put them together, you construct meaningful sentences. Okay, and that ac accounting information or financial information is really no exception to the way you might think about language. And uh, the way people feel about seeing an unknown language or hearing discussions in a language they don't understand, I think is very similar to the way people feel when they are faced with numbers, not knowing where to start in terms of how to use them. Okay? So making a case for numbers and making a case for why should one acquire this language sufficiently so that they can be involved in a conversation <coughs> with people who do speak the language. Okay, that's basically what we try to achieve in some of our teaching here. Right, if you were to uh, develop more fluency in the language, you will be able to have improved communication within the organization, and I'll take that case um, a bit further in the remaining time within. But also it allows you to see the business, your organization, your work, um, with the eyes of those outside of the business. And that's also important, especially if you have outside funding for a business that you are uh, making decisions for. Right? So when somebody else provides you funding, they'll want to know how you're doing. And being able to um, appreciate and communicate in this language sufficiently allows you to also understand the concerns of those outside who <coughs> might have funded the business in addition to its very important function of course helping people communicate within the business in terms of setting targets in terms of making progress towards those targets etc so I think really again with that feature it ticks the box in terms of it being a language All right? And we do this, um, in fact, taking this language approach, the way we motivate it, et cetera. We do this definitely for finance, for non-finance executives, the course that I, I direct here, um, which runs uh, a few times a year, four times to be specific. And of course, we can do it in other formats too. But when we approach my colleagues, um, I'm the subject area chair for accounting. When I or my colleagues go into a classroom, really, we need to not just teach somebody a list of words. That's not, that's not the point, right? Everybody's time is limited. Our role is really to make a good case for why this would be helpful for people to actually have sufficient familiarity so that they can go on um, making decisions, making right decisions for the business in, in collaborating with others who do speak the numbers and also control the resources too. All right, so how do numbers or how can they help you? Okay, so what, what is something uh, that we can get help from, uh, from the numbers. So now, the objective, as I said, trying to break the ice with the numbers and getting sort of this mindset, the onset of this, I feel anxious about numbers, I'm not a numbers person, I've never studied accounting, that's okay, there are many people like that in the world, they, they just do fine. It's more the mindset of, I'm not a numbers person and I don't wanna see them, and transforming that to, I'm open-minded about numbers, and I think that's the <coughs> first step, okay? You wanna warm up to numbers, and I think a short course on numbers definitely achieves that in my experience, having taught here for 10 years now in that program. But I think it, it, I'll take it one step further, okay? And I'll make it, I'll make it <laughs> even warmer. Numbers are your friends, because every time you come up, uh, across, not come up, but come across a situation when you are discussing resources. There is always numbers behind those resources. And somebody, it might not be you, but it could be you too, controlling those resources. So the moment you sort of feel comfortable about numbers and feel that you can communicate using the language, you are able to take a more critical part in those decisions and feel more confident about those decisions. And that's what I feel quite passionate about. And I think my colleagues and I uh, find that quite an exciting transformation when we see our students, participants arrive here and say, really, I really didn't want to spend any time looking at numbers all my life. Here now I find myself about to take a FTSE listed uh, CEO role. Well, uh, I certainly need to know the language. Um, this is really high time that I get comfortable with it. And I think uh, they certainly see the payoff. All right. Now, I'm going to skip 
not skip, switch uh, to this one case I wanted to talk about. And as I said, I will want to leave some time for your questions at the end. I picked performance measurement as a case for numbers. Okay? <coughs> so performance measurement, so measuring how somebody is doing. Somebody, when we think about individual performance measurement, but it could be a team measurement, it could be a division's performance, it could be overall company, how is the whole company doing? So performance measurement as a case for numbers. And the reason, um, the reason I um, take this, it has relevance for both within company uh, decisions, but also of course the way outside views the business because depending on the company, some of this information is shared with the outside world, the stakeholders, the investors, etc. So keeping track of how a business does is relevant for internal decision makers as well as the capital providers. Okay? But I'm gonna, I would like to approach it from the internal perspective for the, for the moment. So I gave you Aston Martin as an example just to show you some small print numbers and then I blew it out and so told you that they have a bunch of assets, the resources. Okay, So assets are resources in accounting speak. In fact, resources that a business has rights to control in undertaking its business, if I'm being very specific. All right, so when Aston Martin has access to those uh, assets, the resources, the likely scenario is that they would have used some external funding, or at least some of it. And especially given that they've recently listed themselves, they have gone through an initial public offering of the company, which transformed the ownership from private equity ownership to at least some public ownership. Okay, so that's sort of backdrop uh, institutional detail in, in small quantity. Now, when you look up Aston Martin and what this business is striving to do, what's their vision? This is what they say, okay? What I have on the screen is uh, what they say, uh, and they, they say that the group, so Aston, Mar de Ma uh, Aston Martin Group's vision is to be the great British car company that creates the most beautiful and accomplished automotive art in the world. Okay, so that's their vision. That's their aspiration. This is what they are, they are saying. This is what we are set out to do. Now, of course, that's a very vague statement. So if you think about sort of going about your business on a day to day, yes, that is probably guiding principles, but you're gonna have to have something a bit more concrete to work towards. Right? So how do you think Aston Martin is planning to achieve that kind of vision or that, that aspiration, how could they make it a reality? Now, of course, companies go through different time periods and then uh, come up with different strategic priorities or plans. The most recent plan they have in place, which they put in place in 2014, is called Second Century Plan. Second Century Plan, and um, they've been implementing it uh, for some years already. It comes in three uh, settings or three uh, pillars, I think they refer to three phases, okay? First one is business stabilization, okay? That was the first couple of years, they have achieved that. And then the next one is core strengthening and um, the last one is expanding the portfolio, product portfolio. So <coughs> they have a strategic plan in place that will be obviously a medium term thing, about five years or so. And they would like to achieve this plan by 2020, although last I checked, I think they are going to extend that a little bit by a couple of years. Uh, the innovation is coming along, but maybe a little slower than initially anticipated. So they are being quite ambitious. Um, so these are a bit more tangible when you go and look at the details of those. In fact, the first one, the business stabilization is put in place because Aston Martin has gone through a turnaround. So it wasn't doing that well in terms of being able to generate profitability for the investments the company has, has had in place. Uh, they needed to be turned around. And in fact, that business stabilization phase has been successful, according to their own statements. Since 2017, they are reporting a profit. Okay, at least as one of the objectives as coming back to profitability, that has been, that has been done. Now, core strengthening is about uh, putting in uh, the right uh, processes in place and everything so that they can enable the innovation coming down the line, as well as um, strengthening their dealership networks, etc., etc. And then expansion of product portfolio is becoming innovation focused again so that they can bring to market new things and, and so that they can sort of 
uh, claim, um, I guess, leadership in the target market that they identified as high, um, I think, high luxury sports cars, etc. Okay. All right, so that's their strategic plan. Now, how am I tying it to performance measurement? Now, if that's your plan, if you say in, uh, say, five years or so, I would like to, as the business, or we would like to achieve these expectations or, or plans, you would also need to obviously have in place some control mechanism. How well are you doing towards the objectives that you set out? Okay, so performance measurement. Now, if I put on the screen what they have themselves stated as part of their corporate performance uh, targets, key performance indicators. A uh, few examples are revenue growth. So they would like to increase their market share, increase their sales again on the back of selling exciting cars again. All right? And then they would like to improve um, EBITDA margin. So if that sounds like a random collection of um, initials put together, it might be the case. Earnings before, interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization. It's sort of a, it's sort of a summary measure or an approximation measure people like using to proxy cash flows, although it's not a cash flow measure, it's not a cash measure, but it's a reported profits before um, depreciation and amortization. And so they would like to increase that. They would like larger operating profits, in other words. I guess that's how we could, um, in a simple word, translate that. And then they would also like to um, keep an eye on the dealership. So they want to enhance the dealerships, add to the dealerships. They, they want to be able to have that, I guess, uh, sales floor capacity so that they can then <coughs> um, plan to grow the revenues more sustainably. Right? So those are the three things that they highlight. Now, you probably have already noted that all these will be numbers. Yeah? Number of dealerships. This is a number from the income statement. Div this number divided by sales. And revenue growth is last year's revenue compared to this year's revenue um, in a percentage. OK. So these are all numbers, but only two of them. The first two are financial indicators, OK? Because they come from financial statements. So that's the distinction in terms of when you do performance measurement, when you come up with indicators. Of course, performance measurement, as the word measurement implies, you're going to quantify some progress, OK? So whatever measurement you will do, it will result in some sort of a number. It doesn't have to be the uh, sort of quantity like number of dealerships. It could be from a scale uh, from one to five, how well did this employee do? Five being excellent, that's a number two. But it's always about quantifying some progress or some evaluation. But only two of these, the first two, are financial numbers. And the other one is a non-financial indicator, still relevant, of course, for the business, given that it makes and sells cars. Okay? And what we will see, of course, um, in, in practice, many companies use a combination of the two. With especially for top management uh, with financial indicators, so the bit that I'm looking to mystify, demystify, uh, to make a case for, the financial indicators having a larger weight. Okay? So that's a, a reason to, I guess, think about the numbers being relevant to keeping track of progress towards strategic priorities and plans. And of course, that strategic plan being in place so that the business can make progress towards its aspirations and its goals. Okay? So it's not just about measuring performance, it's about what we can learn from those indicators so that we can redesign any uh, sort of elements of the strategy or set new targets or incentivize people in a, in a different kind of way. Uh, I'm not sure the number of dealerships uh, is kept within a performance indicator. Uh, having a dealership is not an objective of its own uh, aim, it's just a means to an end, and the end is to make more sales. And so my argument is that the number of dealerships is redundant towards revenue growth, and so should be out of the performance. That might be your preference, and you can also suggest to them that that might be putting in perverse incentives. I want to come to that in a minute. You're absolutely right. Uh, not every number that we see in a performance measurement sort of table if you will, for top management or even individual measurement, is necessarily capturing the sentiment that you really want to have in a performance measurement. 
and just having another building that's open so they can have instead of 164 next year 165 is that the right thing to do not necessarily unless it also comes with profitable uh, properly allocated capital that's generating sustainable profits absolutely um, yeah because they have picked it. Right. This is this is them saying things, not me advising Aston Martin what to do. <laughs> Why didn't you make a lot of money advising them? <laughs> 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 yeah, um, right. Because I could spend the afternoon with you. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, but I have I have in the past advised companies, um, and I have not picked a number like that. Yeah. But yes, of course, of course. Aston Martin has yes. a problem with that. Yes. Yes, right? so, yeah. so, so it's we'll a, it's come a, it's back a to it in a second. For a reason. Yes. Yeah. And the reason was that it, you know, they wanted to expand the number of dealerships they had, specifically in certain markets. Yeah. The dealership is an important part of their distribution channel. Right? So, so the more dealerships you have, that, that's the logic of the company at the time, and it's, it's accurate for Aston Martin. Yeah. It gives you an ability to sell more yes. of your cars, promote more of your brand, in certain market demographics, right? So that's why the Aston Martin identified that as yeah. a performance indicator. For that yeah. car company, yeah. it works, not for all car companies. Yeah. Okay, uh, you argument that uh, uh, it's the number of dealerships, mm -hmm. not high number, is you an ability. Correct, Correct. Yeah. absolutely. That's right. Yes. So if I can... Not a yeah. That's right. So um, if you're defining the ways to achieve targets, and that being a channel through which that performance target can be facilitated, it would still make sense provided you having a careful look at at what cost are you adding another dealership and what are the gains you're getting from it, right? So um, for Aston Martin, if they are going to sell these uh, really uh, expensive cars uh, that go really fast and they look awesome and you can only click on the website to say, maybe I can book one for a test drive, and you want to do this uh, in many places in the world, maybe it's not that easy to scale up the sales. So you need to have physical presence. And uh, in a period of turnaround, I suppose, sometimes what happens, not sometimes, quite often, is you would close a bunch of those dealerships that are not profitable. But now that they are coming back to uh, being strong and reporting profits, they can now scale back to the way that they think their type of product is best uh, sold or marketed to a larger group of target customers. Okay, revenue growth, EBITDA margin, a number of dealerships, and I'm going back to just to wrap that up. Two of them are financial indicators. One, non-financial, although measurement implies what you see in front of you will have some numbers behind it. Okay, but I think when I see I'm not a numbers person, people tend to complain about these two rather than measuring this because, I mean, that doesn't come from a financial statement, so you don't have to deal with the accountants. Okay? <laughs> anyway, so those are indicators, and we want to know what these things mean, and uh, that comes from getting a bit more familiar with, um, with, the, with the numbers. Now, I did already give you some of this. This is, again, them saying I didn't. This is a public document that they put on their website for public consumption. It's their third quarter update of what's happening in this year. And this call was also um, last week or something very recent. And um, they, what, they, what do they need to do? So this is now going back to financial information being relevant for internal communication. So going back there, um, staying there for a, an, another moment, this is about, you know, how is the business doing? Now, we could find out about this externally, which is I'm going to show you in a second. But this is also what the business will want to keep track of themselves. If they say, our aspirations is to make the most beautiful car out there, uh, be, be the greatest British company that makes the car art or whatever it was, I'm not, it's, it's up there. I won't do justice to um, rephrasing it, you see. It. They will want to know how well they are progressing through the strategic plan and whether they are being consistent with that objective or the vision. So internally, you're going to design tasks to facilitate that kind of vision pursuit. You're going to design, obviously, performance measurements so that people are on the right path and you have the, set the right uh, targets, etc. But taking it to the outside, you also need to sort of give an update in particular, because now you are publicly listed too, in this case, 
you are going to give an update in some shape and form. And in their case, it is a conference call that the CFO and the CEO are live at a certain point in time after their third quarter closes and the information is out. And they go through a slide deck like this. I only brought you one, one page. If you're curious about the business, you can look at them yourselves. But the thing that I wanted to emphasize is the outside world also cares about your numbers. Right? So they are going to come and say a few things in sort of bullet point nature, telling people, those who care about their numbers, in terms of the progress they are making towards that strategic priority is the plan that they have established. So they have been able to um, report a revenue growth that's related to that first performance indicator I showed you. Okay? So they were able to uh, report an increased revenue. 80% of revenue growth. They were able to report digit, triple digit growth in Americas and Asia Pacific, including China, year on year. Uh, triple digit growth, and this is in units sold, just to be clear, because obviously growth in what? It, it matters. These are not uh, dollar values sold, but in terms of uh, the number of cars sold, just to be um, clear. And then the other few things are about their innovation um, plans. Uh, they come up with, they, they put out the uh, refreshed model for one of their cars and they have been able to um, reach the milestones for their SUV. Apparently this is an SUV. And this is, this is, this is them becoming a competitor to Tesla, which is another company we could talk about in the context of numbers. Like and, their, and their CEO um, commenting on their, on their numbers quite passionately in different, in different venues. But this is a, a plant where they will start um, producing electric cars. Okay, so they, they have that in place too in the part of their innovation plans. And then this last one is the slightly bad, bad news. It's not bad news, but remember when I said the strategic plan was good for the next five years, that uh, second century plan. So in that fifth bullet point, they are saying that product portfolio expansion is now pushed till 2022. So slightly delayed, slightly or not so slightly. But anyway, so that's basically how what businesses do. Use of words. Yes. Pipeline. Yeah. Program, yes. Sort of, you know, yes. Of course. Of course. Yes. Of course. You always have to be. So this is my other hat. If I put my investor relations and corporate communication hat, all those words are very, very carefully picked, right? Mm -hmm. And we need to know exactly why they use that word as opposed to some other word in the context of understanding the numbers too. Yeah. So there's always uh, more to the words and more to the numbers and whether they match is they actually the, the thing that makes the numbers quite understanding the numbers even more powerful. Okay, so that's just one example of performance measurement. I think I gave you a very sort of overview picture of in what context numbers are relevant from within the business. Um, it also is relevant to the outside world. So hopefully uh, that makes a case for knowing more about the numbers. Now, why is it useful? Okay, I showed you a, an example of um, sharing information on performance measurement and how a business goes about doing that. But really, why is that useful for an organization? Uh, it will obviously enable um, the business, the organization, to link the actions to strategic plan. Right? So how are you going to prioritize things? Otherwise, if you don't have a plan in front of you, that is guided by resource allocation. So enables linking actions to strategic plan. This is performance measurement using, um, using anything. But as I said, in practice, a lot of the times, especially as you go up in the hierarchy of organizations, when you are making decisions that control resources too, you are likely to see more financial information-based performance indicators uh, than non-financial ones. And then, of course, barring aside the issues we just discussed anyway in terms of volume-related uh, things and square footage related things. Uh, performance measurement or having controls linked to performance measurement and keeping an eye on how people are, um, are doing towards their set objectives also allows delegation. Now that's actually a very powerful thing because you can be a startup and things are going well and you're scaling things up and you're going to start letting go of some of that control of doing everything by yourself and making all decisions yourself. As, as you are able to capture the important elements of how to uh, pursue the mission that you set your business for, 
and you're as you're able to uh, define tasks or define jobs that would support that without you doing everything, of course then the need of being able to see how others are progressing towards that sort of common set of objectives is a very important thing. So doing good performance measurement allows you to uh, come up with a good sort of definition of roles and, and, and keeping an eye on how that all fits together in achieving those objectives. So performance measurement is not measurement for measurement's sake, just so accounting professors can get some uh, exciting discussions by showing pictures. It's more about facilitating businesses' function uh, properly in achieving their objectives. And then, of course, when you have set those targets and when you have been able to identify those roles, you are able to then incentivize the type of behavior, the type of action that you are looking to have in place so that those strategic plans are, are achieved or more likely to be achieved. And on the back of that, people can be rewarded and motivated. And this need not be, by the way, taken in the spirit of if you do more of performance generation, you should always generate more monetary rewards. Incentive design could not need not just rely on more money, more bonus, more that, but having uh, the understanding behind what sort of activities should tie to the strategic priorities gives you the kind of understanding that you might want to design. Um, and why use financial information in performance measurement? Because we uh, had a brief discussion already about non-financial indicators too. We could just measure performance in any way we'd like. Why not um, pick number of stores, which we discussed, or um, you can also say, okay, we would like to um, reduce carbon emissions, which you should. I can say that, that's my opinion. And, um, and you should definitely have measures like that too, but why, in the context of having many things we can measure when we're at it, why put in place financial measures too? Okay, so what do we gain by using financial information? It's their relevance and reliability. The, the accounting language, okay, so that's my, my language, my group sitting upstairs there, this is our, our thing. The good thing about it is, is that it captures underlying economic transactions. It's designed to capture what's happening to the economic res resources. And therefore, it's relevant for economic activity. Now, I also put another word there, reliability. Um, now, it's also about these numbers being uh, looked and checked and them being according to certain rules and standards, okay? And therefore, rather than me sort of sitting there and coming up with random ways of measuring things, if I really want to capture economic progress towards some objective using resources, when we know that the rules are there to report how resources are used in a consistent way, I think that gives them a, a strength in terms of being relevant for performance measurement. Okay, so they are reliable. Uh, and of course, not to mention, there is the auditor out there who comes and looks at our financials and signs. And if you would like to uh, give me pushback about the audit profession, we can do that over the coffee break. <laughs> okay? <laughs> now, another good thing about financial information is that it is um, comparable. Comparable. Again, this links back to something I just said. The rules guide how things are reported. Now, the rules don't really differ much, and I'll just have to say much because sometimes uh, depending on the industry there might be a different treatment, but for the bulk of what happens on a day-to-day -day for a business, the rules are such that similar things that happen across different times or similar things that happen across different companies are reported similarly, okay? And that results in comparable information. And that's very useful, that's very useful when you want to think about how a business is doing over time, because obviously this is not a one period game where you really want to report profits just once and then you're done. It is about sustainable uh, business developing certain uh, returns to the capital that's being invested, okay? Or sustainable performance, however you define it, so you want to be able to compare performance over time. But I put down across the field as well, because when you are thinking about making a decision, you are generally choosing out of alternatives, okay? So it can be about investing in a business. It could be about investing in a different project. It could be many things, but at the end of the day, you are always making a choice. The choice could be also making nothing, doing nothing, right? So it's always a choice about how best to use resources. 
And therefore, when you make those decisions, you want to be able to say, OK, can I really evaluate these decisions? Or when people from outside look at the business, and I did show you the quarter three um, earnings call when investors, in fact, the analysts are asking questions to Aston Martin because investors would love to know. Um, it's about investor or other capital providers looking to say, instead of Aston Martin, if I invested in Tesla, what would have happened? Okay, it's about comparing performance across the field as well. Yeah? So it allows financial information, allows uh, comparison across the field. This may be my uh, last picture. I have a couple more slides. And this is my analogy. And this is sort of the, the analogy I try to, to make when I talk about measurement. So there are some uh, famous numbers there. In particular, I guess Usain Bolt in the third lane there. This is London Olympics, 100 meter uh, men's final. So <coughs> when I think about performance measurement, it's also the objectivity I try to think about. Okay. So when you think about a 100 meter race, now the objective is I guess, for the individual athlete to cross that line the first. Uh, for some, it might be breaking the world record. It could be many things. It could be doing your personal best. I mean, you go in there. I have no idea how you go in there. I'm not an athlete. But I certainly admire, uh, admire athletes who compete at this, at this level. But the, the good thing about something like this is it's objective. There's a clock. Unless the clock messes up, you know exactly, you have a line, you know exactly who's crossed it the first time. So this sort of across the field comparison is easier in some settings than in looking financial statements. Yeah, uh, because you might think, okay, this is one business, this is another business. I don't know exactly whether they are comparable, but the, the fact that they are financial information, the fact that they are uh, built on the back of rules that are consistently applied allows you to make those reasonably objective comparisons. Okay, so that goes back to the reliability and how well you can measure things if you are if you are looking to looking to use information. Now of course um, we can also think about well rules can allow for some judgment and those judgments can be uh, used in a way to uh, manipulate outcomes and therefore maybe we want to stay away from numbers but I would still push it back to Knowing sufficiently well about numbers gives you the ability to ask the right questions about challenging the assumptions that go behind reporting the numbers. Ask the questions, ask, the, ask, the, uh, ask your finance colleagues who might be putting the numbers together to push them as to why that assumption as opposed to something else. Right? That always is a very powerful thing to have. Unless you speak the language, you don't challenge sufficiently uh, enough. And then, and then, of course, um, we might end up with uh, not so awesome decisions being made. All right. Uh, our approach here to teach this sort of how do we demystify, how do we teach people numbers? We sort of take the perspective that resources are limited. Your resources, your time is limited too. But when you go back to your business, the business's lim uh, resources are limited. It's both time and money, both of them, right? So then you need to think about how best to go about making the decisions with respect to allocating those resources, both time and capital, time and funding. And then, of course, how do you, once you made those decisions, how do you ensure successful implementation of those decisions by speaking the same language so that people are aware of the kind of performance targets set in place, why they are set in place, because numbers or targets are really not helpful if they don't make sense. Why do they make sense? Why are they the right performance measures to put on the plate given the strategic uh, priorities and given the vision. So that linking through the whole chain of uh, thought, I suppose, is far more um, fruitful if you are able to converse in, in numbers. So here we start with the basic principles, really. We appreciate the accounting as an information system and embrace that. Okay, So we really appreciate the fact that Yes, it's according to a set of rules and standards, but it requires still assumptions and judgments. And we need to embrace that so that we can give you all the power to be able to go ask the right questions. Okay? So we do really care about the principles of the information itself. But then we define performance. Okay, What is the best way to think about performance given limited resources and time? And how do we go about tracking the performance of using those uh, resources the right way? 
And then, of course, we embrace the fact that we need to think about making comparisons. This is sort of the athletes running the same race all together, but also businesses looking to uh, gain further market share in the same, uh, same sort of sector or something. Or it could be you as a business being a potential target as an investment to someone who is looking to save their uh, hard-earned pension pot, right? So it's, it's relevant regardless of what perspective you take in terms of um, as to why you might care about performance. Uh, comparisons are important. And then we also take it back to the operating decisions too. Having a strong understanding of the cost of a business is really, really important and how you think about activities that generate cost and how they map into the different areas that you're looking to achieve. For example, more dealerships generate more costs, but aren't if they are generating the right kind of profitability or the market share, that's the target market that the company is expecting to achieve or intending to achieve, and they are able to do that successfully. Actually, that's, that's a good type of cost that you want to manage, but not necessarily um, be sort of rushing to cut, right? So all that is really, really important uh, because if you think about costs as just numbers, you don't want numbers, you don't want costs. That's a bit of a narrow-minded approach to, to go, about <laughs> go about business and decision making. So we really spend time thinking about how costs are structured and how they need to sort of be uh, accounted for to be able to make the right operating decisions. And then we also integrate investment opportunities into our decision making because that's obviously um, one of the big areas of decision making, especially as you have more control over resources. Should you pursue that project or the other one? Or should you go after that business, that startup or another? Or should you start a business from a <laughs> even, uh, even the first principle question? Is this the right thing to do, given time and resources are limited again? What sort of expectations should you have? So investment opportunities. And then we'd come back a full circle when we teach this sort of numbers for non-numbers people kind of content. We come a full circle and then think about how this understanding that we built through time in that course would feed into setting the right strategic priorities because numbers are important if you give them a purpose, okay? So we don't just teach numbers for numbers sake, we bring it back to why you actually have some strategic priorities and how you best think about identifying the right kind of measures to sort of incentivize for. Okay, so with that, I'll conclude. So I'll just wrap this up as, I hope you leave this room thinking numbers are a language, okay? And um, whatever the mission or the vision of the business or the organization is, that it will never have unlimited resources. Both time and funding will be limited, okay? So then the ability to communicate in the numbers language, my type of language, um, financial reporting to be specific, it really does enable both finance and non-finance people to have more ability to collaborate and work together to identify the strategic priorities, but also achieve them. Okay, so with that, I'll conclude. I hope I made a case for numbers besides uh, the famous numbers we're all familiar with. And I will um, now open up for further questions. Thank you. So um, there's a history to Aston Martin. I don't know it okay. well, but there is a history. Okay. So it was apparently bought by a private equity house. Yes, it was. Previous owner. Okay. Um, <coughs> what, uh, and, and then it's turned around mm -hmm. on the surface of it. In practice, mm -hmm. we don't really know. Okay. And then it's IPO. So yes, very recently. So we don't. Money yeah. in, money out. You get that balance sheet as information. What would you be kind of looking at particularly? in the view of that history to see you know how solid this turned around was what the future of the I, I would say it would be f too premature for me to comment on it mm -hmm. because i haven't actually gone and done a proper analysis of it what i but looked at it in the con what yeah what would i want to know i would want to know um how sustainable all that is i would want to know um, how much of the work they put in place they say they are 80 percent done with this work how much uh, with that work they've put in place, they are able to sustainably generate reporting the results they've just reported prior to the IPO. Now, I, I'm happy to take any pushback about reporting. So IPO is a time where 
obviously you're going to want to portray uh, the company is in the best light possible. And I would want to know uh, this recent reports of profitability, for example, whether that was a rush to the IPO and accelerating certain things being on the financials, or is it something that's actually legitimately there, which it might be, but not temporarily, so that, that it will be. And to be able to do that, I would need to look at further data than just look at that balance sheet. But absolutely right. I wouldn't, just by looking at the balance sheet, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to conclude anything. They also want to generate, you know, they, they have their eyes on free cash flow generation capacity, etc. So that's only one of the many financial statements I'm sure you're familiar with. Um, I would definitely look at their income statement. I would want to forecast some future earnings. I would want to see what their cash flow is doing, all that. It, this wasn't appropriate for my mandate, but <coughs> yes, I would definitely want more, more numbers. I would want more numbers. <laughs> Thank you. It's been a pleasure to be here this afternoon. I hope you have a case for numbers mm -hmm. and that you are a bit more <laughs> like, I don't, I'm open-minded about numbers. Okay, Thank cheers. You. Thank you. Thank you.